Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name's Aaron Harris. I'm a partner at Y Combinator. And before I was a partner at YC, I founded a company called Tutorspree that went through Y Combinator in the winter of 2011. And today, it's my honor to introduce someone who doesn't really need very much of an introduction. But I'll do it anyway. Fred Wilson has been investing in technology for close to 30 years. And in that time, he's founded two separate VC firms. The first one, Flatiron Partners, was founded in, in 1996. And the second, Union Square Ventures, was founded in 2004. Without a doubt, Fred is one of the best known investors on the East Coast. And he's one of the premier consumer technology investors in the world. He's also created, through his blog, AVC, a, co a lively community which is home to wide-ranging discussions about finance, technology, government, and his taste in music. If you all join me in welcoming Fred Wilson. Uh, so that was a, I'm sitting here, right? I think you're in that one. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so that was a great talk by Shanna. You know what I love about Shanna? She has opinions and she's not afraid to share them and that's what makes great investors. I think investors need conviction and she's got conviction. Well, it would seem like if you were waffling on each of your investment decisions, you'd never really reach anything good. There's a lot of people in the venture business who hedge and yeah. follow and, you know, try to figure out what the hot thing is and, and don't have like a, like a, you know, kind of their own opinions. I don't, by the way, I don't agree with, I probably don't agree with half of what Shanna said, but, <laughs> and like, we argue about these things, and, but I appreciate that. Like, she's probably right a bunch of places where I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. I might be right in a few places where she's wrong, but that's okay. That's why I think investors need to have that. And, and, and entrepreneurs sometimes get annoyed because they walk into a meeting and they're meeting with you and they're like, um, this guy's just not buying this at all, you know? And, but, you know, it's better than I think pitching to someone who's just like, you know, like saying nothing. I think mean, that's right. pretty awful. You know, it's interesting. I guess if all the investors agreed with each other, prices would rise infinitely and no <laughs> deals would actually get done right. at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, sitting in the room with an investor, with someone who comes to you with a pitch, you know, what's going to make you decide that you believe in what they're doing versus saying, you know what, this isn't really going to work? What are you looking for? Well, we have opinions, right? Mm -hmm. So, that, and sort of goes back to what I was saying about Shanna. We have certain opinions about what's interesting to us. So, we come into the meeting with a preconceived notion about what we're looking for, what's exciting to us, what's not exciting to us. So part of it is, is just that that entrepreneur is connecting to some preconceived notion that we already have. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I remember uh, back when Brad and I were raising the first USV fund in 2003, um, he said to me, why isn't there a Google for jobs? Like, w instead of having to go to Hot Jobs or, or Craigslist or Monster, like, why can't you just go to some place and search and just have every job posting on the entire internet like filtered for you? And um, I was like, gee, that'd be a good idea. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then one day uh, I was reading my friend John Battelle's blog and he, he mentioned this company he had launched called Indeed. And I was like, Brad, there it is. That's the thing you've been looking for. And like, we called him up, we're like, let us invest. They're like, no, we don't want to talk to VCs. <laughs> kept calling him, kept calling him, eventually, you know, at five times the valuation that we originally thought we were going to pay, we did get to invest. So that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's an example of a specific idea right. that you have in mind, a specific company that you want to see formed. Right. Is that typical of how you make investments, or is it more thematic? No, that's rare. Like, we're, uh, entrepreneurs are the ones who generally come up with the great ideas, mm -hmm. uh, and we react to them. So it's generally more sort of thematic um, that uh, we just have certain ideas about um, what's coming and given that that's coming, this should happen and boy, so we should look for that thing. Um, and, and, and sometimes those, like, these ideas are sort of half-baked and not fully formed and then an entrepreneur comes in and you're like, yeah, 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 that's what I was thinking about. But hmm. they've kind of like crystallized it way more because they obviously thought way more about it. Like when you're, when you're building a company, you're doing one thing, like you become obsessed about that one thing and you, you get really deep into it and you, you, you generally understand that opportunity better than an investor will. 
So this is actually something pretty interesting that you're touching on, which is something we talk about a lot when we look at applications, which is the ability of the founder to communicate his ideas right. or her ideas clearly and well is so critical. Because there are a lot of people who probably have thought about these things very deeply. Right. What do you think it is that, that drives certain people to be able to communicate that? Or what do you react to in terms of that communication and that clarity that, that stands out? Well, you know, this is, um, uh, th I think this is true of a lot of investors. Um, it, I like it when somebody can explain something very crisply and very simply. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and, they, and they get you to the sort of um, nugget of what they're doing um, right away. I mean, not, not by rushing into it, by, but by just kind of simplifying it and, and, and making it easy to understand. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that some people are born with that gift. Uh, other people, I think, can develop it. I, I, I have worked on that myself over the years, and I have found that I've gotten better and better and better at that. And I do that a lot of times for our uh, portfolio companies when it's the next round or maybe the entrepreneurs decide they want to sell. And so we get involved in helping them do that. And I have found that I've gotten good at positioning the opportunity quickly mm -hmm. in a way that's you know, very, uh, hopefully, attractive to the person on the other end of the phone or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's really a really important skill, is to be able to um, explain what you're doing, and I think without buzzwords, you know, because it's so easy to fall back on buzzwords um, or three-letter acronyms like yeah. CRM or something like that, and, and people's eyes tend to glaze over. I think it's, it's um, another temptation people have sometimes is to say, I'm the X for X. You know, I'm you know, Etsy for electronics, or I'm Uber for helicopters or whatever and and you know that's a really in some ways a really great technique yeah. but it also sometimes trivializes what you're doing right so but but I think being able to communicate crisply and clearly is really important it's interesting that you mentioned the this for that thing when we yeah. uh, when we applied to Y Combinator uh, with Tutor Spree, we pitched ourselves as the Airbnb for tutors. Right. And part of the reason we did that was it allowed us to pack a lot of information into a very short sentence. Exactly. Uh, it turns out we were totally wrong. We were not the Airbnb for tutors. It was, it was not the right way to look at the business. Um, so what did PG say when you came in and said, we're Airbnb for tutors? Great. He liked Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, no, he, he, he was into that. He was like, ooh, Airbnb. I mean, this is... This is... So he responds well to that. He, he, did, he did in that case. Um, <laughs> and it was interesting. I, I think that he was looking at us as a founding team and then thinking about what could happen next right. with the company. And, and Airbnb, this is four years ago, was certainly growing quickly. You had already turned them down. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, but they were certainly held I've got out. an open wound right here. You want to pour some yeah. more salt on it? I mean, we've got to bring it up every time we talk to you. It's just, you know, it's uh, a good story. But you know what's funny? I, I think what you just said about, um, you said um, uh, something about the, the team was good mm -hmm. and the potential of what they could do with the idea, mm -hmm. right? I think that's what seed investors are good at. Yep. Seed investors are really good at um, sort of connecting to the potential of the team and um, the potential of the big idea right. and not getting caught up in much more than that. Uh, we, we sometimes invest in, in seed uh, rounds, but usually those are seed rounds for companies that have already shipped a product. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we, and this is a criticism, or maybe just an observation of USV, we're actually not very good at the thing you just said that mm -hmm. seed investors do. I think we're very good at um, evaluating a team once they've created a product. I, saw, I see Zach Sims just walked in back there. And when Zach and Ryan shipped Codecademy, right. you know, we were able to say, oh, fuck, that's amazing. Right. Like, we, we need to invest in this, yeah. right? We also knew Zach and Ryan. We knew how great they were because, you know, we were hanging around Columbia University trying to find interesting teams coming out of there. Um, but so it was the potential of the team on top of something that they would already shipped into the market, right? right? And I think that's what we're good at. And I think that great seed investors don't need to see the product. They, they somehow can recognize the potential in the people that they, they're going to create that product. Yeah. And I think we, we, we find it that hard to do. Now, Codecademy is a pretty interesting example of that because when they launched, 
they'd only been working on it for a few weeks, but it launched to, I mean, it was an unbelievable They nailed launch. it. They nailed it, right? The traction was huge immediately. <laughs> right. So when you compare that against other, you know. Well, well Shannon was saying, you know, do something different. Mm -hmm. I, I think they were the first people to do in browser, you know, like writing code in browser as right. a way to teach coding. I think so. Yeah. Zach, is that right? Were you the first? Yes, he claims that they were. Yeah. Um, so uh, don't know we can believe everything he says, but but, you know. but that was a unique tweak on yeah. the idea of how do you teach someone to code, mm -hmm. and so that that I think was was part of why they you know right. kind of just took off because it was inviting to people. You know, it's yeah. like oh I can do this. So when you're looking at that sort of takeoff moment. What metrics are you looking at? Is there a specific set of things you're analyzing, or is it just a general momentum somewhere? We, d we don't have like a number. Like people mm -hmm. always say to me, how many, how many monthly active users do I need before you're going to invest in, in my mm -hmm. company? I was like, I have no idea. It's more sort of, um, it's, it's more sort of um, uh, based on um, the market, um, the product, um, what you would expect for a product like that. Certain things that are you know, super viral, um, you'd want to see much larger numbers. Mm -hmm. Things that are more utilities, um, smaller numbers, but you know, the right kinds of engagement might, might be more important. Niche services that have sort of high value niches, um, maybe it's even smaller numbers, but just, so it's, I, it, we don't have a formula. We don't have like an algorithm or anything like that. We've we've toyed around with, uh, and, a, and my partner Albert is is enamored of this idea, Moneyball for VC of you know could we create an algorithm and just essentially like crawl the internet and and like run algorithms and that'll just tell us what companies to invest in. I don't think it's that simple. Um, I think it's a little bit uh, more art than science. What's most likely to trick you on that decision? Um, well, a good example is turntable. Mm -hmm. It's a turntable was a monster right yeah. out of the gate. Uh, it ended up not working. Um, and so their problem was that they had a churn problem, but their acquisition was so high in the early days that you, you, you couldn't really see the churn unless you really knew how to look for it. But over time, the churn revealed itself, and and then it, it you know just could never get beyond that. And I think that the churn was related to the fact that the that a lot of people listen to music in a very passive sort of way. Like they, you know, take a software engineer, they they go into work, they you know put on their music, they put on their headphones, and they're grinding away. And they don't actually want to be like in a room mm -hmm. engaging with people around the music, right? So it was too intense, and people just. Had, they're like, I got to get off of this. I got to go back to Pandora or whatever else I'm listening to. So um, that was what I think caused the churn. But so we got head faked on that one. Would you make the same kind of bet again? I mean, there was a huge amount of momentum behind that. It was, I think right. the, the raise. Well, you know, but also, so that, let's unpack that a little bit yeah. more. Um, I'd known Billy for six years, and I'd known Seth for close to well, 15 to 20 years. So mm -hmm. it was a team that I knew really well. Um, and they had this super hot property. And so it was kind of the combination. And I'd, I'd been looking to invest in one of Billy's projects for a long time, because I always had recognized his talent. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of, it was like the perfect storm of, I like the people. There's a, there's a product-centric entrepreneur here who I've always respected and wanted to work with. Um, and now they've, they've, they've nailed it, they've hit it. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the fact that the people side of the equation was, was so strong for me meant that I was willing to kind of maybe not be as uh, diligent mm -hmm. in the analysis of the phenomena. When you've made that decision, right, when you've made the decision to invest in a company and it's certainly coming the A, B round, mm -hmm. what are you expecting people to go and do once they have your money in their bank? Um, well, at its core, I think doing a startup is building a business. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that what I would want them to do is get on with the building of the business. And I wrote a blog post today about um, the, the metaphor of going up a flight of stairs. And step one is building the product and getting to product market fit. Step, and that's generally what I think of seed money for. Mm -hmm. And then 
um, getting a you know getting a Series A done so that you can go beyond the the founding team, which might be two or three or four people, and, and go out and build sort of a ten or twelve or fourteen person team to really you know um, get you know the all of the aspects of the business going, really create sustainable growth, and and really in, continue to invest in product, and then once you've you know, proven you can do that. Series B would be around building full-blown business, scaling the team, taking the market, becoming the dominant product in the market, and then um, Series C, get to profitability, and then after that, take the company public, sell it, do a secondary. Um, and so each of those steps along the way is ultimately in furtherance of building a company, building mm -hmm. a real business. And um, so I, I see it sort of as, a, as a, just a march through those those paths, and I, I want to see people commit to making the investments in the business that are required um, to make all those things happen. So it's it's usually about um, you know continue to invest in product and build out a team, um, get to a business model, execute that business model, get revenues, get customers, continue to build the team, and um, if the entrepreneur um, Either gets unfocused and like starts, you know, lighting up a whole bunch of side projects, or is reluctant to build a team, or there's just some, you know, kind of classic uh, red flags you get sometimes um, when you start to see that they're for whatever reason not really kind of committed to um, that sort of grinding away on the business that I think is you just got to do. Mm -hmm. You've been watching companies raise money and spend money for. 30 years now. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of talk about how starting a startup is, is easier than ever. Alexis mentioned all you, all you need to do now is open your laptop. Uh, with AWS, costs are, have, have gone down remarkably, uh, but the seed rounds are getting larger and larger. Right. Um, so what do you think is going on there? I think it's just a function that there's a lot of demand uh, from investors, mm -hmm. you know, everything from angel investors, seed investors, VCs, and lots of other uh, types um, to put money into startups, and so I think entrepreneurs are in a, you know, in a in a market in a seller's market where they can raise a lot of capital, mm -hmm. and a lot of entrepreneurs are, are are choosing to do that because they equate capital with runway and runway with increasing the probability of success, um, but I think that's a little bit of a trap because I think that. Um, with um, a limited amount of money, too, too little money will kill you, mm -hmm. and too much money will kill you. Um, with a limited amount of money, if it's sufficient, it focuses you and constrains all of the possible things you might do and makes you and your co-founders you know, make the hard decisions about, um, do we do this or do we do this? We can't do both, so we have to pick one. Let's do this. It forces you into this kind of process about optimizing the most important things and mm -hmm. doing the things that are going to get you to where you want to go. And I really, really like that. So I, I, I think that um, the market is at a, at a stage right now where you, where you, you could go out and do a $2.5 million seed. Um, I, I, I'm generally, I would generally advise founders not to do that. Given the low interest rate environment and the fact that it doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon, where right. growth and inflation are, mm -hmm. you could reasonably assume that that kind of capital interaction is going to go on for for quite some time. So, as an investor looking a little bit later, mm -hmm. uh, are you at all worried that the traditional size of the rounds and the, the prices that you pay for rounds are just going to get to a place where it doesn't make sense for you anymore? Well, I mean, if you look at, at you know we've been USV is ten years old this year, and if you look at the prices we were paying for seeds and Series A's in 2004, 2005, 2006, that was here. Mm -hmm. And then in 2007, 8, 2000, 2007, 2008, 2009, that was here. And then in 2010, 2011, 2012, it was here. And now it's like here, mm -hmm. right? So it just keeps going up. And, you know, we, we have reacted to that by, um, um, I think, uh, uh, making some changes. Uh, we've become more willing to invest in places like Iowa and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and and Berlin and and um, um, you know other parts of Europe, and so that's 
going to where the supply demand equation is is not quite as in favor of entrepreneurs as as it is in Silicon Valley and you know New York and and um, increasingly you know other parts of the United States. So uh, that's one thing we've done. We've gotten a little bit more picky. Okay, if we're going to have to pay those prices, then damn well be you know a, you know a risk reward uh, equation that we're we're happy with. So maybe we want to see a little bit more traction. Mm -hmm. Um, or want to, you know, really back a super high quality team. So that's how we've managed it. I guess it could get to the point where we think we're not going to make money, but we don't see any evidence. Maybe, maybe seed and Series A have been mispriced for 25 years, right. and maybe the market's finally starting to price them correctly. When you think about a seed investment as basically a very long, long option, right? You know, where it's either worth. 100, 1,000 X, or it's worth nothing, right. you could argue it's worth a lot more than people have paid for it in the past, and maybe that is what we're seeing. Yeah, in, in, that might be because the success rates of startups is going up, and therefore, I mean, when an investor is pricing uh, an investment, unfortunately, the entrepreneur is paying for the fact that a number of, of the investors' investments are not going to work out, right? right? So, I mean, what we want, we, we understand that a third of the things we invest in are not going to work at all. A third of the things we invest in are going to kind of work, but not, not particularly well. And, and it's the final third that actually produce all the returns. Mm -hmm. And so the entrepreneur who is taking money from us, who's in that group that's producing all the returns, is actually paying a little bit for the failure rates, right. uh, because we're thinking about it, you know, what's the blended return on our portfolio? Well, if failure rates go down because of things like YC that increase the, the probability of success, and I, I, I absolutely believe that YC does that, um, then uh, maybe that's part of why pricing has gone up. Given that the world is so connected now, I mean, we have the internet, mm -hmm. thank you internet, and people out on the internet are watching us now. Um, Investors are finding deals all over the place. You're finding, you mentioned Philadelphia, right. Berlin, all over the place. So given that, it would seem that there would be parity in prices wherever you are. It shouldn't matter that your location is Silicon Valley or New York or Berlin. It's the same. Not yet. Not yet. So AngelList why? maybe has the potential to change that. I mean, if we really end up with a, a NASDAQ-like market for, mm -hmm. for seed and Series A and Series B investments, then, then, then that would, would happen. But Still a lot of uh, investing, particularly seed investing, is local. And uh, people want to be able to meet the entrepreneur and hear the pitch and, and possibly you know, join a board or at least be on an advisory board or, or spend some time on a regular basis with the entrepreneur. And so that means that entrepreneurs who are in places where there is a lot of capital, like Silicon Valley and New York to a slightly lesser extent, but there is a lot of capital here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are in a better uh, situation than than entrepreneurs who are in parts of the world where there I isn't much of mm -hmm. that money. Um, so, so, and, and I think also investors may have a higher comfort factor with uh, startups that are in uh, regions that have a, a, a lot of startup density. I'm not entirely sure why that would be the case, but I think that's probably is yeah. true. I think there's something of an environmental mm -hmm. aspect to that. When you're around other people who are doing startups and are talking about technology, I think it's beneficial. Right. I know that when I left finance to work in startups, um, at which point, by the way, I applied for the USV analyst program and was summarily rejected. Um, Without even an interview? No interview. Wow. Yeah. So thank you, I guess. I mean, it, it's worked out pretty well. Um, uh. You know, but, but this is part of why YC thinks that We'll find great startups wherever they are. We right. want them to come to Silicon Valley, sort of see how things are done there, right. and then go back. Right. Right. We came back to New York. Or, or not. not right? right. Wherever is best for your business. Right. That's kind of where you should be. I think that's right. Or whatever's best for you. Right. I mm -hmm. know um, some entrepreneurs want to build their companies uh, in a place where they want to raise their families or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that could be Silicon Valley. That could be New York. That could be Boston. It could be Boulder. It could be. Yeah. You know. So. Um, I do agree that you should do the startup in the place that's best for you, but I also think maybe you should do it in, there's probably at least a dozen geographies around the world that have enough startup density and enough yeah. investor density that you know, would be a decent place to build a company. I would say you pick, pick one of those. Yeah. Don't go to 
you know, some out of the way place that it'll be hard to recruit management. Right. To. Even if there's cheap housing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it's really, really hard to recruit people to, um, you know, if you were doing a startup in um, Bozeman, Montana, like mm -hmm. I think you'd, you'd I mean, I, I don't mean to pick on Bozeman. It's a wonderful place. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just think you'd have a hard time recruiting, yeah. you know, really high quality talent there. I, either you're going to find it locally or you're kind of stuck. Yeah. I was just in Israel a couple weeks ago in Tel Aviv. And, wow, there you go. Uh, and I was, I was struck by how vibrant the scene was there. I knew that there was great technology there. I knew there were great investors. Uh, but it seems like some of what's going on in San Francisco and in New York is starting to seep out to the rest oh, of the Oh, I think world. it's, well, I mean, you know, Israel has been a startup hub for a long mm -hmm. time. Um, they had a little bit of a, of a period where they, th it reminds me a little bit of what happened in Boston, although I think that um, Israel uh, has, bounce back stronger in some ways than Boston. But what happened was there was this transition from sort of more infrastructure and enterprise right. stuff to more to consumer care. stuff. Really, uh, around the time we started USV was when it kind of really started to, to happen. And uh, entrepreneurs and VCs in both Israel and Boston, I think, struggled to make that transition as quickly as entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. And New York, it was easy for, mm -hmm. New York was, easy to make that transition because it always had a bent that way to begin with. But Silicon Valley, I was always impressed by how quickly they made that transition. And I think that um, Israel went through a little bit of a, of a period where they, they struggled. But they got, they got their mojo back. And because you know, they've been doing startups in Israel, particularly in Tel Aviv, for 20 or 30 years now, at least, um, they have a lot of repeat entrepreneurs and a lot of talent and a lot of um, knowledge about how to do these kinds of things. So you say you take, you take a team to Silicon Valley to kind of see how things are done there. Mm -hmm. Well, the people in Israel know how to do a startup. Right. So um, they have the culture there, and, and it's, it's, it's a great place. Yeah. And unfortunately, we don't have much more time left, but I do want to turn back to New York mm -hmm. one last time because it's, it's where we are and it's where we want to be finding more companies. And right. You know, I'm curious, over the next, over the next few years, look, looking back the last few years at what's happened, right. what do you see coming in New York that particularly interests you? Well, the big observation is that um, enterprise SaaS-type business models um, seem to be thriving uh, in New York uh, right now. Um, there's, uh, we have a few in our portfolio, but they're, they're, everywhere I look, I'm seeing really good uh, SaaS enterprise companies getting built here. And that was definitely not what the vibe was in New York in 2009, 2010. Now I think it's a balance. Mm -hmm. Still lots of good consumer stuff going on, but now I think we've got an, you know, an equally strong B2B SaaS uh, type of um, startup uh, uh, environment here. And that's really good for New York because, you know, it, it, it you know, you need to have both kinds of companies. I think they're, um, you know, it's helpful for VCs to have both kinds of companies mm -hmm. in their portfolio. And I think that, you know, the talent pool um, here in New York can work in, in both. So that'd probably be the big, biggest change. And then also just so much more capital here, yeah. uh, which is great for New York. Yeah. Well, Fred, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.